The book of Mark, chapter 1, verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Son of God. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, and with a leather belt around his waist. And he ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name for your word. Oh God, I beg you, please, that it would burst off the page and burst into our hearts. This morning, I pray that, Lord, we need that, Lord. In Jesus' name. Okay, you may be seated. So a couple weeks ago, we finished up in the book of Romans. On Sunday mornings, we go through a book of the New Testament. After we finish a New Testament book, I I typically take a break before the next one, which is what we've been doing for the last, oh, 10 years or so. In between New Testament books, I spend about six weeks somewhere in the Old Testament. For example, we went through the life of Abraham. We went through the life of Jacob. It had been my intention to go through the life of Joseph at this time. One of Jacob's children. Wonderful life-changing character study, Joseph. That had been my intention to do that. And then after that, I was going to start the book of Galatians. But here recently, I really feel like the Lord made it really clear to me that because of the intensity of the time we are living in, that we need to get back to Jesus. We need to get back to a study of the life of Jesus, meaning a study in a gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. So I decided that after spending about six weeks studying the life of Joseph, we would go to the gospel of Mark. But the Lord pressed harder. He says, Steve, you need to get into the life of Jesus now. This is what the United States needs now. This is what Calvary Chapel in the city needs now. So skip over Jesus, rather skip over Joseph, and go right to Jesus. Okay, Lord, we we won't do Joseph. We'll go right to Jesus. A dear brother in the church was scheduled to be in the pulpit this morning, right now. 
where I am. And I was going to begin the book of Mark, the life of Jesus, next Sunday. But yesterday morning, this dear brother texted me and told me he was not feeling well and he couldn't teach. The Lord really, really, really wants us to focus on Jesus. He wants us to be like Jesus now in the United States of America and in the city of Boston. You and I need to devour this book together because the world is trying everything it can to form and fashion you into its own right now. And how how I see the body of Christ being affected by the voices out there, by the lying spirits out there. It, It wants to make you into an angry, divisive, frustrated misfit. That's what the world wants to do with you right now. And I, and I fear for your souls, Calvary Chapel, that this happens to you because some of you, I see it happening. I see it happening. You need to focus on Jesus Christ if you want something different happen because if you devour this book with me, you will become a joy-filled, peaceful, strong signpost that points people to the living Jesus Christ. If you devour this book with me, that will happen. You will become a signpost rather than an angry, divisive misfit. You will become a joyful, peaceful, strong, a source of Strength to the people around you as you come out of this thing that we're in. Many of you are already in that place. You are in such a stronger, joy-filled, more happy time than you've ever been in your life, and it's because you've been devouring this book. I know. I know what's been going on with you. Praise God. But now we're going to do it together. The thing about Romans, uh, right there through Hebrews, those letters, wonderful books. But they're about, they're more, uh, supremely, they're more about the Christian life after Jesus was resurrected and ascended into heaven and how to live the Christian life, what it is about. But, but the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I never l- like to go too many years at Calvary Chapel without getting into a Gospel. Just, w- Jesus, who are you and, and what did you do? Like specifically, what did you do when you were here? What did you teach about? Interestingly, in the letters that follow the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, meaning from Acts all the way uh, off to Jude, there's not a whole lot of quotations of Jesus. Very few, in fact. Now, we need to devour those letters as well. They're, They're here for a purpose. They are living and active as well. They were, that, the book of Romans was incredibly transformative to me, but they don't quote Jesus very much. You need to go into the Gospels in order to actually read what Jesus said and find out what he did. So the book of Mark, the book of Mark, this is what we are, are going to, uh, to, to, to be in. And, and you know what I want? I, I'm mindful of the fact, I'm mindful of the fact growing up with the posters of Patriots players over my bed, wherever I lived, in the whole world, actually. I didn't, even, including outside of the United States. I had those posters. But, but, but you know what I say today? Away with the man or woman in us that as soon as the service ends, wants to run to the television to 
watch a Patriots game or to run to the mall or to run to the afternoon barbecue. Just checking off a religious box so you can go off and do what you really want to do. If you devour this book with me, when you finish up on Sundays, you will be pleading with me for more. More, Steve. More of this. More of Jesus. Teach it. Preach it, Steve. If you devour this book with me, there's a lot to devour. Let's read chapter 1, verse 1 together. What does it say? It says this. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It's unique. It's unique amongst the gospels. Matthew starts off with a long genealogy of the descendants of Jesus. Starts off saying the, 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 the... Jesus, the son of David, descended from Abraham, and then goes through. The book of Luke doesn't talk about Jesus until something like chapter 1, verse 30, or something like that. The book of John, actually, in the beginning was the word, begins about talking about Jesus from eternity past. And we thank God for those other gospels. You put them all together, and that's what we need. But Mark starts off like this. Jesus is the Son of God. Now pay attention, is what he's saying to us, is what he's saying to me. Jesus, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Wow. The Son of God. The Son of God. He's saying, can I get your attention, Mark is telling us. He's right. It was the first of the Gospels written. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This was the first one. The Son of God has come, he's saying. And this is his story. The creator of the world has now come into the world, and he wants you to know him. And and, And if there's one thing true about man, about you and me, it's that we need this Jesus. We need God. We need the Son of God. I, I just finished up a, a one-year reading plan through the Old Testament. And so um, as soon as I finished, I went right back again to Genesis. I've started that up. And I'm always struck by a verse at the end of Genesis chapter 4. Last verse of Genesis chapter 4. Don't have to turn there. But uh, I'm always struck by this verse. The first two chapters of Genesis are about the, God, how God created the world. Genesis chapter 3 is about how Adam and Eve rejected God and his authority over their life. Genesis 4 is about the misery and ugliness that followed. It took only one generation after man rejected God for him to start killing each other. Cain kills Abel after rejecting God and his authority over their lives. It just takes one generation to do that, and that's just the tip of the iceberg of man's problems. But Adam and Eve have another son, and his name is Seth. And it says of Seth, Genesis 4.29, let's take a look at this verse. I'm always struck by the, uh, by the last verse, and this is it, of Genesis chapter 4. As for Seth... To him also a son was born, and he named him Enosh. Then men began to call on the name of the Lord. In other words, it started to become really, really obvious and painful to man that was living at the time that they were desperately missing God. It became really obvious that life was not happening without God. And they began to call on the name of the Lord. We're really stubborn. Took us, what what was this, four generations? Three, three, four, four, I think. Four generations to figure out. We got to start calling on the name of the Lord. They had cast God out. And now they realize, oh God, we need you. Please, God, we need you. We can't live without you, God. We need you. And they began to call on the name of the Lord. Why? Because they can't live without him. We learn from the book of Romans, our year and a half study that we just finished, from the book of Romans, the very first chapter. 
that from creation alone, in other words, it, it, even if not a single word of this book were ever given to man, man can know many things about God. Not some, many, the Bible says. Just by creation itself, man looking at it, he's going to figure out a lot of things about God. Genesis chapter 1, verse 20. We were in this verse for a couple weeks, uh, way back when. says this, For since the creation of the world... His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead, so that they are without excuse. His invisible attributes, it says, are known just by going out and looking, looking at, uh, and we went through this list at the time, looking at, at an ocean. I'm in the oceans. You get before an ocean, and, and, and something in you cries out, God, uh, you, uh, the, the, the beauty of a lake, uh, the rivers, the meadows of the world, the, the forests, the jungles, the mountains, the hills. The desert, the sky, the stars, the sun, the moon. Cry out, God, 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 God. There's a message of who he is. The vast diversity and beauty of the animal kingdom. Flocks of geese, flocks of flamingos, a herd of buffalo, a herd of elephants. Schools of fish, a bald eagle, a roaring lion, a giraffe, a panda bear, a a field of wild flowers, a rose bush, an orchid. Butterflies, grasshoppers, ants, they're, they're all crying out the invisible attributes of God, a thunderstorm, a windstorm, a snowstorm, an eclipse of the sun, all breathtaking events in which we know, yes, God, we're, we're, we, we can figure out and be taught a lot about God just by what he created around us, the, the sound of a gifted singer. The movement of a gifted dancer. The speed of a gifted runner. Cries out, God! The, the, the stunning design of the human eye, the human hand, the human immune system. The reality and the beauty and the intensity of human love. We know a lot about God. A lot. without ever receiving even one word. The Bible says we know a lot about God. But that is not enough. That is not enough. Man began to call on the name of the Lord. We need so much more than knowing about God. We need God himself. Oh God, we need you. And so the Old Testament, more specifically, Genesis chapter 12 forward is about God's response to the cry of man. God through Abraham begins a redemptive plan to bring man back to himself by bringing himself back to man. And so the Jewish prophets, the descendants of Abraham, begin speaking of a time when God himself will actually break into human history. And they continue speaking, and they continue speaking, and they continue speaking about this happening. God breaking in to human history. And then it happened. And the first gospel writer, Mark, who we know as John Mark, writes it down. And he begins, verse 1, here's the beginning, here's how it started. He skips over the birth. 
He, Luke and Matthew will pick that up later. He goes right to when Jesus burst on the scene and he broke into the public arena. Being obscure up to that point. The, the beginning of the gospel, which means what? Good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. God, we need you. God says, now you have me. That's good news. Now you have me. So let's begin. Let's devour this book so that we can know the Son of God, our Savior, our Lord, our friend, our portion. The Bible calls him our portion, meaning he is what we need. He is what we must have. He is the satisfaction of everything we desire. Who are you, Lord? We want to devour this book, Lord, because we want to know you, and we want to know you now. At the end of the book of Mark, where Jesus is, um, is being tried on the morning of his crucifixion. He's, uh, the Jewish high priest asks, asks him, are you the Christ? Are you the one that the prophets spoke about? And spoke about again, and spoke about again of, of the Son of God, the Messiah, breaking into uh, the history of the world. They said, are you the one? What did Jesus say? I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And we know from the book of Zechariah, we know what's going to happen when that happens. It, it, it says in the book of Zechariah, uh, chapter 12, verse 10, when that happens, when Jesus comes as he promised he would on the clouds and with power, it, it, it says, they will look on me whom they pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. Look at what I did to my Savior. I pierced him with my sin. Calvary Chapel, we don't want to wait until his return to respond, to respond like that to respond to who he is. Oh, 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 wow, he's coming on the clouds. I better take him seriously now. No, 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 we want to respond now. That's why we gather together. We want to become signposts, signs pointing the, our very lives overflowing with, with Jesus because we got him, we have him. The son of God, this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God. Let's devour this book. So let's, verse 2. So Mark continues. He begins the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He <laughs> this guy begins so loud and clear. So Luke just gradually gets into his message. Because Luke is writing to a rich nobleman. He starts off with some courtesies. But, but Mark just goes, bang. And he says in, in verse 2, he says, As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness Prepare the way of the Lord and make his paths 
straight. Now, as I mentioned, the Jewish prophets had spoken again and again and again and again about the time that God would break into human history, and they describe the one who would be breaking in, the one and only Son of God. So verse 2 is from the uh, prophet Malachi. Verse 3 is from the prophet Isaiah. So verse uh, 2, uh, uh, Mark saying, look, the, the Son of God, he didn't show up without a big time warning and prophecy, many of them. One of them is in the book of Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, in which he said, Malachi uh, said, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. This is speaking of the Christ. Many of your uh, Bibles there have the word you capitalized. That's speaking of Jesus. Jesus, he's speaking to Jesus. It's, it's, it's an interesting verse there in Malachi. I'm going to send a message, messenger before you, son of God, and he's going to prepare the way for you. That's Malachi. That's how, so, so Mark, beginning the book, his book, this way. Now, if you go to the book of Malachi and read the verses right after that verse, this is what you see. But who can endure the day of his coming? This is speaking of Jesus. And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver, meaning he will be like a, a fiery furnace that gets rid of our impurities, the, in, gets, makes the wrongs of the world right. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver. That's verse 2. This is what his readers would have been familiar with. This is the Son of God. This is who he is. Who is going to endure the day of his coming, the Jewish prophets had said. Now, verse 3 is a quote from Isaiah chapter 40. And verse 3 again says, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. And Isaiah, right after saying that in chapter 40, describes who the his is in, the, uh, in those three, four words, make his path straight. Make whose path straight? The Son of God. And this is what Isaiah 40, how Isaiah 40 verse 11 says, he will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. This guy, man, he is just coming right in. He's right up front. He's not wasting any time describing to you who this son of God is. Now, I hope some of you notice that the Son of God that was described in verse 2 and the Son of God that is described in verse 3, well, the, the descriptions are opposite. <laughs> Let's go back to the first one in Malachi. Who can endure the day of his coming? Now go to Isaiah. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arms. What? Brother, sister, listen. You need to feed yourself on both of these every single day. Why? Because you and me, we're a complicated mess. <laughs> we are one complicated mess and we need both of these and only the son of God is both in perfection what did we learn 
from Romans chapter 7. We were in that too for a while. Romans chapter 7. We learned this. You don't have to turn there. But Paul, after receiving the Son of God, says this about himself. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Now, which of the two verses, Mark 1, 2, and 3, does Paul need to combat that? Well, I think both, right? Right? In Malachi chapter, in Malachi chapter uh, uh, 3, verse 2 and 3, where the Son of God is described, who may endure the day of His coming, who can stand when He appears. He is like a refiner's fire. We need, as Freddie talked about last week, a fear of God remembering who our Savior is. He doesn't kid around. Now, it is true that once a man or woman has ask King Jesus into their life that they are no longer nor ever will be treated or be inflicted with the wrath of God, which Malachi 3 largely deals with. But because that went on Jesus on the cross, he absorbed all the anger of God, all the judgment of God, the wrath of God for you. But we need to remember because we live until we get a glorified body upon Jesus' return. We need to remember that we live in a body of death and we have a, 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 we have a, a body that cries out and just wants to rebel against God's word, wants to rebel against him, and oh, something holy and safe happens when we open up his word, the Mark chapter 1, 2, and 3, and we read this reference to this verse who can, day, who can endure the day of his coming? I need that. I need that every day. But guess what? I need verse 3. I need Isaiah chapter 40 verse 11, which says, but he will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom. Why? Because I am one weak dude. I am weak. As we read the last, the, 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 the last um, teaching of the book of Romans, we, we, we focused on what? The gospel strengthens. And what did I say? I'll say it again today. I've never met not even one strong human being. Every one of us has been weakened, broken by sin, we need this. We need the Son of God because we are weak. We are fragile. We are vulnerable. And our sin has broken us. We, we are more broken than we'll ever know until we see the Messiah face to face. And we need a, a, a shepherd who feeds his flock with his love, with his mercy, with his, it says he gathers the lambs with his arm. He carries them in his bosom and gently needs, leads those who are young. I need a gentle Savior. I need a gentle Savior. Psalm 118 says, His gentleness has made me great. I need the gentleness because if he was a harsh Savior, I'd be done. If he was a harsh, abrasive shepherd, I, 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 I wouldn't survive that. I need this. We need both. Why? We're a complicated mess. That's what sin has done for, with us. And this is Mark just comes in and says, this is your Savior, the Son of God. Boom. He just starts off like that. I think it's worth here just pausing and talking just a little bit about this guy, Mark. Who is he? Who is this guy, Mark? 
We first see his name, I think, early on in the book of Acts when Peter is in prison. And it says, in the house of the mother of John Mark, known as Mark, the, the disciples gathered there in prayer. But then this guy, Mark, he shows up later on in the book of Acts, in Acts 15, and uh, rather Acts 13, he went out with Paul and Barnabas into the Gentile world, the non-Jewish world, and started, and Paul and, and uh, Barnabas were declaring the Messiah to, G, uh, to, to the world. People were coming to the Lord. Their eyes were opening up. They were running to the Savior, the, their Savior King, the Son of God, realizing, just as you and I do, that we need this Savior. We need this God. Well, John Mark was in that very first time where, uh, that, where Paul went out with Barnabas. But what happened in Acts 13? Someone shout it out. He bailed. He MIA'd. Too much intensity, too much fear. He went back. And then the, the whole thing, it didn't, uh, with, with Mark, uh, it, 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 in Acts chapter 15, it says Paul was going out on his second missionary journey to go to different cities. And speaking of this guy, Mark, it says that um, Paul and Bartimaeus had a huge argument, so bad that they could no longer minister together with themselves because Barnabas was like, hey, let's give this John Mark another chance. Bar uh, 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 that's what Barnabas was saying. And Paul was like, no, we can't have that happen again. That was unbelievably disruptive. And they actually parted ways. You can imagine being John Mark and the humiliation that the man who wrote a third of the letters in the New Testament didn't want to take him around. Didn't want to take him along. Now later on it, it, in the New Testament, Paul is pleading for this guy. I need this guy. Bring him to me. I want him. But this guy knows the shame and the humiliation. He knows it. And, 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 and I just love the way the book that he begins this book about the Son of God. Again, let's see, um, uh, Caio, if we could see again the Isaiah verse. He knows how much he needs, how much he needs. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm. That A man or woman, when you fall flat on your face, this is what you need. And this is what your Savior, the Son of God, gives. This is what he gives. He pulls you up. He doesn't reject you. Man may reject you. God will never reject you after, you've, after you have become born again. And so um, Mark writes this letter with this heart, with this need. Now another crazy thing about this guy Mark is that at the end of the book of Mark, there's a couple verses that scholars have scratched their heads over for centuries. Jesus is being arrested. Roman soldiers show up with temple officers to arrest Jesus. And you see these few verses here, very odd verses out of nowhere. And you only see them in this book, the book of Mark. It says, they all forsook him and fled, meaning all the disciples bailed on Jesus as well. They kept, why? Because they, were, were, uh, they feared. But then it says this. A certain young man followed Jesus, having a linen cloth thrown around his naked body. And the young men laid hold of him, and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. Whoa! What is this? Well, I think most scholars today... Think, thinks that this person is none other than Mark, the author of this book. And there's good support for that because oftentimes as you look at the New Testament books, only the writer of the book will put shameful things about themselves. You actually can do a wonderful study of that. 
but the other, offer, other authors don't include the story. They're protecting their brother. But the, there was such a humility that had, been, uh, that, that had been worked into the followers of Jesus, they will just come out <laughs> and tell the story. So many believe that this is talking about Mark himself. And if you go back, um, Caillou, if we can have the Malachi verse, why did he run away and flee? He was scared. He was scared of Roman soldiers. And and a guy like Mark um, is going to have to remember that, that now he doesn't need to run away anymore from Roman soldiers. Why? Because he follows a Messiah of whom it is said, who can endure the day of his coming? I, you know, I'm on to my, uh, another psalm that I'm trying to memorize. It's Psalm 118. In Psalm 118, um, I think it's verse 10, says, says this. It says, all the nations surrounded me. But in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. They surrounded me. Yes, they surrounded me. But in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. They surrounded me like bees. They, They were quenched like thorns of fire. For in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. Listen, once we are in Christ, we need to know that this is the Messiah backing us up. We don't have to fear man anymore. We don't have to fear the Roman soldiers that have come to arrest us. Mark knew this. But we're a complicated mess, aren't we? But this is what we need. So how are we supposed to respond to this? Well, verse 4 says this of Mark chapter 1. How are we supposed to respond to the coming of the Son of God? How are we supposed to respond? How is someone supposed to respond? Uh, you, you may be in the service today, and this is the first you've ever heard about it. The Son of God, God breaking into human history, and this is who he is? Who can endure the day of his coming, but he's also a shepherd. That you gather, uh, he gathers me into his arms. He's willing to do that. Here's the response. John, speaking of John the Baptist, verse 4, came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Repentance. Making a swift and complete change of direction from the direction that we were walking in when we were rejecting God and going right to God, full on. That is repentance. That's our response. If you have never responded in that way to Jesus, if Jesus has just been this God who you respect and and you pay attention to him when it's convenient, you need to repent, is what John the Baptist said. Did that was his ministry when he came in before Jesus to prepare the people for the Son of God who was coming. Verse 5 says that all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. They started running to their uh, running to this message. Uh, John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. More on that next week, God willing. Verse 7, John preached saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandals strap. I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptize you with water but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Let me finish up right now by saying this. Actually, the worship team can come up. We learn here that Jesus comes
with himself as a gift to give to anyone coming, anyone willing to come to him and give their lives to him. And he's willing to, it says, give them the Holy Spirit. And John the Baptist is saying, look, I'm just baptizing you with water. I, I, I'm just baptizing you with water, which is a representation of a reality that's happening into your life when you come to God and he, he washes you from sin. But let me tell you, this son of God, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He is going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Well, we have more to talk about that at a future time. But, uh, Caio, if we could just have John uh, 14, 23 at this time. This is what it means. Jesus says right before he died, he said, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Jesus came, the Son of God, of whom it was said, who will endure the day of his coming, of whom it, of whom it, it was said he will gather his sheep in his arms and, uh, it, it, and cling to them and bring them into his bosom. It says that he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, meaning the Father and the Son will make their home with you. That's who the Son of God is. That's his heart for you. He wants a love relationship with you. Yes, it takes repentance. It takes turning away from the empty, vain life that you and I lived and running to him and saying, yes, come in, my king. But this is what he wants for you. What a verse. If anyone loves me, this is, by the way, a reference to the Holy Spirit. So when verse 8 says, says that, that he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, um, this, this is in part what that means. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Him. Listen, we're going to go into a time of prayer at this time. If anything that I have said, always pray that I'm not a hindrance to the Lord on Sunday mornings. But if, if, if I didn't hinder, but something that I said um, struck you to the heart and has stirred you up, just to run after to this Son of God, this, this, this Savior of whom things are said like who can endure the day of His coming, but at the same time He is the God who gathers you into His arms. If, if there's something that has been said that you want to just come to Him and say, yes, I am a complicated mess, I need you, we're going to have prayer people in the back. We're going to open up these back doors, ushers, if you can do this, and we are going to put a little a place uh, there where you can uh, pray with a prayer partner back there. If not, just go to someone else and say, uh, can you pray with me? Actually, I'm going to be back at one of those tables. If you'd like to uh, uh, come and pray with me, please do. But why don't we rise for a closing worship song. I'll close in prayer and we will worship together. I pray, God, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. It's true. God, by looking out over creation, the ocean, the lakes, the rivers a gifted soprano or tenor or bass or a gifted dancer or a gifted NBA player or a flock of geese or a, 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 a majestic forest. Lord, we never would have dreamed any of this that we read about today. We thank you for your word. And I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, do now make it a reality. 
Lord, that when we leave this place, it will spill out from us just onto whoever it is that we come into contact with. 